I'm JG Michael, and this is Parallax Views. Hello, this is Mike Swanson, and in a few moments, you're going to listen to another segment of Parallax Views. But before you do that, let me tell you about my new book, Why the Vietnam War. It's a sequel to my previous book called The War State, which has lots of positive reviews and Amazon's been out for years. But this one is a more detailed case study of how American empire and national security state operate using Vietnam. And I believe it shows also how things work today, how policy is actually made and why. So grab the book on Amazon.com, Why the Vietnam War. This edition of Parallax Views is brought to you by the $10 and above tier supporters of Parallax Views on Patreon. So, with that in mind, producers credit shoutouts to Gunner, Mark, Alexander, Catherine, Kilo, Emilia, Jeff, John, Bert, Brian, Elliot, Michael, Brace, Nick, Mersham. Galen, Arlen, Bo, Gigadelic Media, Chance, Chase, Dan, David H. Y. Kellerman, Saadeid13, Kathleen, David, Ava, Bob, The West Bank Robbery Podcast, Jamie, Enoch, Gary, Max, Ishtofer, James, Martin, Matthew Ho, Brian, Nobody, Thomas, and Dano. And now on to the show. Hey there, Parallaxius listeners. Sorry for my absence the past few days, uh, but I wanted to let my listeners catch up on some previous episodes. And I've been busy with a lot of other things as of late. So I hope you weren't too perturbed by my absence, but Parallax Views is back. And we have a conversation today with Joseph Avasar of the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation. This was recorded back in November, but I'm only releasing it now because, well, I have a back catalog of shows I need to get out there and this is one of them. I still think it's as evergreen as when it was recorded as we delve into the idea of a confederation model to solve the Israel-Palestine conflict. With that being said, let's get right to it with Joseph Avasar. Welcome to Parallax Views, a guest that I've been meaning to have on for some time uh, and we just, it, it, there was a lot of times I wanted to have him on, but finally we made it happen after a few false starts, and that was all on my end. My apologies for that. Uh, but I'm going to be speaking with Joseph Avasar of the Israeli Palestinian Confederation, which is a really, really interesting uh, project that you know has been endorsed by a number of people, including Noam Chomsky, as well as uh, one of my favorite guests on this show, uh, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson. Last time uh, Colonel Wilkerson was on the program, he was actually talking about your work, uh, Joseph. Uh, anyways, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I, I'm good. It's been a, a rough month um, just seeing all this horror that's taking place from October yeah. 7th to now. But uh, maybe for my listeners, you can tell them a little bit about yourself and your own personal journey towards dealing with the Israel-Palestine issue. You you were born in Israel, and uh, you became an attorney, right? Yeah, I was born in Israel. I lived in Israel until the age of 21. I went through the Israeli uh, educational system and also attended. I, I went to the Israeli military. And... Um, I came to the uh, to the U.S. Uh, in 1974. I attended UCLA. I went to um, I studied uh, political science at UCLA, and then I went to uh, 
Southwestern Law School, and I became a lawyer, and I am a licensed attorney practicing since 1981. In uh, about 2000, I started a organization called the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation, which has the vision of creating a common government for the people of Israel and Palestine based on secular democracy, based on a constitution for the entire area that includes Gaza, the West Bank, Israel. Um, now it's over 14 million people. And um, the vision of this is to create this government federal government independently of the Israeli and the Palestinian governments, because those are failed governments. They are not able to give peace to the Israeli and the Palestinian people. And uh, given uh, my background here in the States and seeing how a federal government could function and make peace, I thought, based on a constitution, I thought it would be a gr good idea to create a federal government in Israel-Palestine. And that's what we I am working for. Can you explain that a bit more in detail? Like how, I, I know, I've been to one of your simulations. How would this work, this, this confederation? In terms of it being created or in terms of its functions once it is created? Uh, let's start with what its functions would be, and then we'll work back to how how something like this could become a reality. Okay, so the idea is that it would be a democracy based on a constitution with three branches uh, in the government. It would be it would have the um, legislative branch with a parliament the executive branch with a president and vice president and a judicial branch, all of these branches based on equality between Israelis and Palestinians. So to be more specific, we are proposing the creation of 300 parliamentary districts in Israel, Palestine, in the Israel, the West Bank and Gaza. Each district will elect one person. So the district could be exclusively Palestinian in terms of its population. It could be exclusively Israeli in terms of its population. But many, many of the districts will have both Palestinians and Israelis in the same district. They will choose a parliament member so we will elect 300 parliament members in the districts that are mixed, meaning Israelis and Palestinians live together. Uh, a Palestinian could vote for Israeli and Israeli could vote for a Palestinian. But at the end of the day, we will elect 300 parliament members. Some of them will be Palestinians, some will be Israelis. And the parliament branch of the government will be able to pass legislation if 55% of the Palestinian parliament members and 55% of the Israeli parliament members voted in favor of that legislation. And then once that legislation passes the parliament, it will be submitted to the separate and independent Israeli and Palestinian governments. So it will be submitted to both of them and they will have a veto power over the legislation. If the legislation uh, is vetoed, then it 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 is not the law. But if it doesn't, if it, if they don't veto it, then it becomes the law of the land of Israel Palestine. So there, there's a lot to unpack there. I guess, you know, I, I think a lot of people look at this and say, so this is definitely not the the two state solution model. And I know you've done a documentary called uh, Surviving Peace, and you take issue, I think, with – or not even issue with, but you you sort of, I think, give reasons why the two-state hasn't happened. Why do you think the two-state solution has been uh, 
something that hasn't been able to be worked out? Well, they don't want it. If they wanted it, and they don't want peace either. These governments uh, do not want peace. They do not want any solution. They they have their own agenda. If they want it, they would have created two states. Um, so that's the the true short answer is they don't want it. Now, I can go through the reasoning that they give, but it's all excuses. The bottom line is the Israelis don't want two states and the Palestinians don't want two states. Are there any differences between your vision and say other people who have talked about, you know, I guess what's been called the one state solution uh, or how would you define it? Well, one state solution is the best solution to make peace. There's no question about it. To have one government in the whole area based on secular democratic principle, based on equality with separation between uh, church and state in, in, in the context of Israel-Palestine, separation between religion and government. That would be the most ideal situation. That would be perfect. But you have to look at reality. And the reality is Israel controls the area. Israel wants to have a Jewish state. Israel is a Zionist entity that created the Jewish state. The Jewish state is based on Zionism. They wouldn't want to have a, and they don't want to have a government that would include the Palestinians. If they had a government that includes the Palestinians, that would no longer mean a Jewish state. In my opinion, it would be safer and better for the Jews, but the reality dictates that they do not want it. They do not want it, and they're not going to give up the idea of a Jewish state. Now, our vision, or my vision, is to say, okay, you keep your principles, you keep your Jewish state, your government, your your military, all the institutions you wish, and so do the Palestinians. But since you fail to make peace, and since you fail to give security to your own people, Israelis and Palestinians, we need to have a common government based on secular democratic principles that would basically be responsible for the sole purpose of making peace. Because the Israeli and the Palestinian governments do not have a vision for peace. And a government that does not have a vision for peace is a failed government. So one thing I wanted you to clarify for my audience, because I, I know there's someone saying this, they'll say, well, there's already Israeli Arabs that are in the Knesset. So it, I, people will say to me, what do you mean when you say that uh, Palestinians don't really have a, a say in things? And I, I always point out to them, you know, I mean, the West Bank is occupied. It's it's a disputed territory. So can you explain that a little for my audience? Sure. Uh, and I get the same objection on the same. Um, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, all the time. The people who say that they refer to Israel pre nineteen sixty seven reality. Before nineteen sixty seven, Israel was a Jewish state that permitted its non-Jews to vote and to be elected. However, since 1967, Israel occupied the West Bank, half of Jerusalem, and Gaza. And not only did it occupy those areas, it also has settlements. It had settlements in Gaza, now it doesn't have settlement in Gaza. Now it occupies 
militarily Gaza. It has settlements inside the West Bank and in Jerusalem. The Palestinians that are in the West Bank, in Gaza, that are under Israeli control, that have to abide by Israeli law and have to abide by Israeli Supreme Court decision, are not allowed to vote in the Israeli system. So you have a, 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 a settler living in the West Bank, and within 50 feet of him, or sometimes in the same building, you have a Palestinian. The Israeli Jewish settler is allowed to vote, has all the benefits of being an Israeli citizen, but the Palestinians who live next to him in the West Bank and Gaza and in Jerusalem does not have the right to vote. That makes Israel a, first of all, undemocratic because the first, one of the first important things for a democracy is that the people choose the government, not the government chooses the people. In Israel, Palestine, it's the government that chooses who the people which people will be allowed to vote, and they exclude the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. And it also creates a system of apartheid because the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza have to obey the, the Israeli law, have to abide by it, but cannot vote for it, cannot decide who the representatives will be. And it's an occupation. So I, I want to note this. So you you would agree with someone like um, I, I I know you've spoken to him. I believe uh, Jeff Halper from the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. Jeff's a very interesting figure because he would say he calls himself a cultural Zionist, and I know that some people get confused about that term. But basically, he believes there needs to be one democratic state because both you know um, Jewish people and Palestinians have a connection a historic connection to this land. Uh, what I wanted to get into was um, this government that, that you're proposing, it, it would be independent from and separate from the Israeli and Palestinian governments. So it, it wouldn't necessarily replace Israeli and Palestinian governments. Can you explain right. that in more detail? Well, it, it would not replace the Israeli or the Palestinian government. In fact, it gives them a veto power. Now, it's not because it recognizes, recognizes the legitimacy of the Israeli and the Palestinian governments. They are not legitimate governments because they are not elected by the people of Israel and Palestine. The Israeli government is elected by maybe uh, the Jews and the Arabs pre-1967 and the settlers. But it's not elected by the Palestinians in the West Bank and in Jerusalem and in Gaza. Therefore, it's not a legitimate government in the whole area. The uh, Palestinian governments have not had elections since 2016, so they are not legitimate governments. But they are not also they are not legitimate governments because they are not elected by the Israeli people. Uh, so you have a situation where you have governments that have power. They have the physical power. They have the the political power. They have the economic power, and they have the military power. The Israeli government has a lot more. The Palestinian government have less, but they have power, and they have political support from the Israeli people for the Israeli government and from the Palestinian for the Palestinian government uh, uh, the Palestinian people support the Palestinian government what we are proposing is a legitimate government the only legitimate government in the whole area in Israel the West Bank and Gaza why would why why do i call it a legitimate government for the simple reason it would give the whole area the population in the entire area, the opportunity to vote, free elections for everyone, regardless of, of their religion, regardless of their nationality, 
the only restrictions would be age, minors will not be able to vote, and and they will have to be citizens of either Israel or Palestine and residents of the area in which they they live. So real quick, on, on the IPC website, uh, you say in the mission that you don't think the two state is viable, um, but you also say the one state is viable. So can you explain that? Because how does your idea differ from some of the conceptions of a one state solution? Well, one state implies one government, not Israeli government, not Palestinian government, not uh, just a secular government. What we are proposing is one government paying attention and paying, giving respect um, to the Israeli and the Palestinian government. It's just like, you know, think about it in, in the United States, you have the federal government and you have 50 states, okay? The federal government would probably prefer that they, that they will be the only one. And there will be no 50 states. They don't have, they probably prefer not to deal with 50 governors and 50 legislative bodies and 50 constitutions. But it's a compromise. And the compromise is that each state, you live in Florida, I live in California, each state will have its own identity with its own constitution, with its own uh, uh, parliament or, or Congress or Senate and governor, but th they will have to work together with the federal government. The only difference is that we are not proposing that the federal government will be superior in terms of its legal authority over the Israeli and the Palestinian government. We are saying that the Israeli and, and that the common government will be below the Israeli and the Palestinian government in the sense that it gives the Israeli and the Palestinian government a veto power. So that that's interesting because you it sounds like there so it's not it's not that this would be like a, a government above the two governments, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um can you well, just it, 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 it would be a government that competes with the Israeli and the Palestinian government. It would in order for it to pass the, the the trick is that it will have to pass legislation that neither the Israeli nor the Palestinian government will be able to veto. It would create legislation that neither side will be able to veto because if they veto it, they will lose legitimacy, both internationally and within their own people. So it's, I, I, I've been trying to wrap my head around it. So there, there would be a Palestinian state, a Jewish state, and sort of the the state within the state, this this sort of third party, a, a sort of federal government. The federal government will be the government of the whole area, Israel, Palestine, the West Bank, and Gaza. From our perspective, it would be better if there was no Israeli government and no Palestinian government, okay? But they exist, okay? They exist. You can't get rid of them. That's the bottom line. Because you cannot get rid of them, you give each side the uh, jurisdiction. Think of it in terms of jurisdiction, not in terms of a state, but in terms of jurisdiction. I, you know, if you live in a uh, in Florida, and let's say you live in a in a um, condominium, or a, a um, you have a homeowner association, you have the city, you have the county, you have the state. You have the federal government, and within the federal government, there are agencies that have jurisdiction. That's, in general, what we are proposing. So each jurisdiction will have its own power based on, uh, on the overall constitution and based on an agreement with the other jurisdictions. In terms of making this reality, 
how would how would you go about that? Because I I was very interested. I only had a chance to attend one of your simulations so far, and I hope to attend more. And I wasn't there for the whole thing, but it was very interesting because you you're sort of wargaming. How can how would this happen in practice? What would have to be done? And I, I think it's really interesting what you do in these simulations. So could you talk a little bit more about uh, just the practicalities that you're looking at? The difference between a common government, a federal Israeli-Palestinian common government being created and now is $100 million. Now, to give some context, $100 million will make the common government a reality. One day of middle-sized war, not full-fledged war, but that we've seen lately, one day of war between Israel and Gaza cost more than $100 million. One day of war. The expense that Israel and the Palestinians go through for one day of war could make a common government a reality. Common government could be created by having an election online. The country of Estonia holds election online that is uh, without uh, any any um, uh, that is acceptable to the people of Estonia. So it doesn't have any fraud. It doesn't have any. So one day, one hundred million dollars could make this common government a reality. We could have people sign up to run for parliament in their districts. We could have people run to be to become president and vice president. And we could explain to the people of Israel and Palestine and the whole world what we are doing and how it would be created. And then we could hold the elections, and the elections could last three months. People could vote in Israel, Palestine, using their computers, using their phones, using their friends' computers and friends' phones. They can go to a library or any public uh, internet cafe and vote, and the vote would be secured, legitimate, and we could create the common government. So I want to ask, can you talk about a few of the figures that you have involved over the years with the IPC and and maybe some of the figures that have been involved in the simulations you've done? Because I, I think you've had people from various yeah. opposing viewpoints. Yeah, we try to have people from all points of views. We are basically inviting- I was going to say, you just had um, a not Will Fun, who I think was- uh, yeah. I think she's very pro-Israel, like not, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's very, very Zionist. She poo-pooed the idea because she wants a Zionist Israeli government. She does not, I, I'm not sure what her vision for peace is. We had people like uh, Alan Dershowitz. We had you debated people, Alan, right? I'm sorry? You debated him. Yes, I debated him on, on the question of Zionism because I think that Zionism is harmful to the Jewish people. It's, it's And uh, uh, we debated him on that issue. Uh, but he, we, he also um, was invited to the simulation, and he had some positive, uh, very, very positive things to say about, about our formula for peace. Really? Could you, yes. could you talk more about that? I cannot uh, uh, verbatim repeat what he said but maybe but the, the gist of what he the gist of positive. what he said is in my opinion is that this is really the only solution for peace that's my opinion of what he said I, it's I interesting remember, because i think chomsky said the same thing right? exactly exactly you know chomsky said the same thing i had a uh you know it, it basically look the idea is the, the the general objections that I get over the, is that uh, Muslims are that the 
the, the Islamic religion is incompatible with democracy. The reality is that it's true. No religion is compatible with democracy. The Jewish religion is not compatible with, with democracy. Uh, the, the purpose of religion, one of the, the goals of religion is, is to have the religious people uh, dictate what the religion says and then the people have to abide by the religion. So it's true. It's, it's very top down, very, you know, the religion tries to be hegemonic over the people. Yeah. Yes, yes. But but the the objection that we get is that Muslims or Islam is totally incompatible and there is like a secret a secret conspiracy by Muslims to use democracy in order to enhance uh, Islam. That's the the real prejudice, uh, uh, stereotypical ideas most uh, against Muslim in relation to the uh, objection to holding a common government or to holding a common election. But the reality is that in Israel itself, you know, it, Israelis are proud of the fact that Israeli Arabs participate in the Israeli democracy. This is a, a Jewish democracy. For them to participate in a Jewish democracy when they are not Jews and they oppose the idea of a Jewish state is basically an argument against those who say that Muslims would not support democracy. In fact, Muslims in Israel support a Jewish democracy in the same rate as Jews. Muslims in the United States participate in the U.S. democracy. Muslim in Europe, wherever there is a democracy, there is no difference between Muslims and Jews or any other religion. So um, I forgot what was your question, but really, the objection that I get, the most common objection, is that the re religion opposes democracy. And I think that religious people will participate in democracy. There is no, it's not inconsistent for religious people to play part in democracy. What I was asking earlier was, um... Maybe you could talk about uh, the reactions you've had to the simulations and how do the I mean, people can go to the YouTube and 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 look up the sim, watch the simulations themselves. Right. But maybe you could talk about just the feedback you've gotten from various people on the simulations, uh, because, like I said, you bring in a pretty wide ar uh, array of d diverse people. Well, the most common objection that I get, and by the way, by, by right now we get 80, 90% of the, we, we take surveys, each simulation, when the simulation starts, and then when the simulation ends, we take a survey of the uh, participants' reaction, and close to 90% ex uh, accept and 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 acknowledge the the idea of a common government but the most common objection that i get is that i am naive i am naive that that as if the idea of the jews and the palestinians or jews and arabs are born and will always remain enemies. And the idea of making peace between them is a naive idea. And my reaction to that is, actually, it's the other way around. They are the naive one. When they have 75 years of constant wars, 
and constant fighting and constant um, bickering and, and killing of Israelis and Palestinians by thousands, not to think of any other way for peace is the naive approach. It's not to make peace is the, it, it, you're, you're not being naive when you think about peace. You're I was going to, can I add to that real quick? I was going to say, one of the things I like about what you're doing, whether people say that, oh, I think it's naive or whether they have some objection to it. I mean, people can say all they want. Oh, well, this sounds like a naive idea because 75 years of this, we haven't been able to solve it yet. How are we going to solve it now? Well, the thing is, to me, what I'm really impressed by is the fact that you're thinking about it. You know, whereas I think a lot of people don't think about it anymore. I, I've said yeah. to multiple guests now, I think the U.S. Uh, government, I think Israel, and I, I think a, a lot of other parties have just kicked the can down the road and said, hey, we could just shelf this uh, Palestine question, this Palestine issue, and, and just not deal with it. Whereas – at least you're trying to work through, well, what could we do to get to a logical conclusion, a, an endpoint, a peace? Well, the question of peace has really not, does not really come up at all. You don't ever see the Israeli press, the Israeli press is, or the international press. I, I, I heard, uh, uh, I believe, Steve Inskip today on, on NPR speaking to... Netanyahu, he interviewed him on, he didn't ask him what is his vision for peace. The question of peace is out of the question. Imagine a doctor that doesn't think in terms of health. He also only think in terms of medication and surgery. And the question of health is beyond him. No one is asking the Israeli or the American politicians, what is your view for peace? Never. And I mean, it, real quick, in the U.S., I mean, now we're seeing again it again where, you know, Joe Biden will give lip service to we really need a two state solution. But I feel like people will talk about a two state, but we don't really ever take that anywhere. And I think that's been dead in the water since at least uh, the failure of the Oslo process. The I mean, the assassination of uh, Yitzhak Rabin, it seems like for as much as we talk about the two state and I'm not saying I'm, I'm like against it. Um, I just I would like to see anything that would be better than what we have now. But it seems like there's a lot of lip service given to eventually getting to a solution, but there's no actions being taken. Well, the implication by your comment is that two state is peace. Two state is segregation. It's segregation based on religion. So. Two state is the is not is not peace at all. It's basically putting Jews and and Muslim in a different part of the border and calling it peace. Why why do you why do you uh, equate two state with peace is beyond me. Now even if it is, even if even if they did, you know, those who. Uh, uh, Propose two state or advocate for two state. They say they use the excuse that the Palestinians and the Israelis they have to have their own um, agenda, their own um, uh, narrative, their own uh, vision, their own uh, identity. They use the term identity. Fine, okay. Well, a common government would probably be the best way to create two state if that's really necessary. Um, because you will you will have parliament members who are elected by the people of Israel and Palestine who will uh, uh, who are familiar with with their people who are familiar with the with the territory and they will if necessary create two state. Why is it that the two illegitimate entities, Israel and Palestine, the Israeli government and the Palestinian government, their representatives take it upon themselves to decide the, the vision for peace and decide the border 
and even if you think that they should be the one, they failed. They failed for the two-state solution has been proposed since the United Nations voted upon it in 1947. It has been attempted again and again and again by presidents, by secretaries of state, by uh, um, prime ministers, by kings, by it failed. So when you say a uh, two-state solution, well, what proof is there that two-state solution is viable? What proof is there that it's uh, leading to peace? What proof is it that the people really want it? There is no such proof. I don't know if you've ever tackled this before, but you know another thing that I think doesn't get discussed when talking about uh, the Israel-Palestine issue is a lot of people look at this as as a conflict between um, just you know Jewish Israelis and uh, Muslim Palestinians, but there's also I think people forget. I mean, the, I'm not saying it's like a huge number, but there are Christian Palestinians in Palestine, and there's Armenians in both Israel and Palestine, and I think in some ways they would benefit uh, from a solution to this issue. Uh, and maybe the Confederation could provide that for them. Could you speak to that at all? Of course. I mean, the, 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 there are also uh, Mizrahi Jews that are not totally in line with the Ashkenazi Jews. And there I, I was going to say, these people, uh, these groups get caught in the crossfire of all this. Yeah, yeah. there are groups that... that I, 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 look... The model that that I am proposing would give benefit to all the subgroups. In my opinion, a lot of them do not want peace because they it, they get a lot more political power when there is no peace. Can you explain what you mean by that? Look, uh, let's talk about uh, uh, ultra orthodox Jews or. Orthodox or right-wing Palestinians. If there is peace, uh, they will have a lot less power. There, I mean, the ultra and also the military. You know the 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 military-industrial complex that is enjoying so much benefit from from this violence going on and the conflicts going on forever they will all and they they will all they're they're gaining power when there is no peace right now at least in their own eyes well yeah because they can they can always say oh look over here you know be aware of this threat you know this other that we see and you have to vote for me you have to yeah exactly it's the it's it's they're using fear they're using fear to divide us and they're using fear to to organize their groups to to galvanize their own group and you know it, it, i'm f- more familiar with the israeli society it is really really a lot of groups um that are not the one thing they have is the animosity towards the Palestinians, but they are not. They are not uh, equal. They they don't think the same. If you could, what has the reaction to the IPC simulations been like since the you know horrific attack that happened? on October 7th, because I, you've had a few simulations since then. Have there been people getting more interested in the IPC's work since October 7th? Have there been people that are like, oh, it seems like this is impossible now? What What's the general mood, I guess, for people involved with the IPC? Uh, we, actually, we get a lot more uh, positive attendance. Uh, people are what happened on October 7 basically created a doubt in the Israeli and the Palestinian mind 
about their own government, about the failure of their own governments, their own. And I noticed that they are looking for something else. Not, not everyone, uh, but I mean, we. I see about uh, 30, 40 percent increase in the participation in the simulation because it's starting to make sense to them that peace is a the only solution. It's starting to make sense to them that the Israeli and the Palestinian governments, including Hamas, did not give peace, did not give security. So what are we, what is the game about? If we don't get peace and we don't get security and we are, and we could personally suffer from this personally i mean you see the, the in israel they see and the these sirens going on several times a day and they have, the sirens are very very scary and children now, are being... I, I, i've i've personally interviewed people uh from israel and during the interviews uh there's been times where you you will say do you hear the siren or do you hear yeah. you know i've had i've had israelis on my show We'll say, do you hear? Oh, there was just a bomb in the background. You know, it's very, yeah, unnerving. Yeah. And the sirens are very scary, and their children are affected. It's not, it's not a game anymore. It's not nationalism in the in the vacuum. It's real. And when you, when things become real, then you start thinking in real terms. Just a few more things before we close out. If you have a few more minutes. So you said that you you debated Dershowitz on um, Zionism. What what led you towards uh, the position of anti-Zionism? And again, I, I get the feeling the IPC is sort of a compromised position as opposed to necessarily like your your position. But what what led you towards anti-Zionism? Well, um, first of all, living here for many many years. I I have an office. I have staff. I I know people, and and people respect, and give me opportunity. I mean, I've been given an opportunity here in the United States, most by many many non Jews, and then I started to think about it. Do I have to be suspicious of these people that are so wonderful to me, that work for me, that are so loyal? What's the point here? I mean, do do we have to live forever thinking that these people are potential anti-Semites? All the people that gave me an opportunity and 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 worked for me and worked with me and gave me jobs and it didn't make sense. It 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 just didn't make sense. And uh I, you know what I thought you were going to say, uh, and maybe you've thought this too, but I, I've said to some people, you know, if Israel was supposed to be a safe haven for the Jewish people, I, I'm not, I'm not sure it's proven to be the best safe haven given. Absolutely. Look, I, I just, um, I don't know if you're aware, but we try to buy a, a huge billboard. Oh, the billboard in Tel Aviv. Tell us about that. Yeah. Yeah. In Tel Aviv. And the billboard was uh, supposed to state a Jewish state is bad for Jews. And um, at exactly the point you are making. A Jewish state has not proven to be a good place for Jews. The only way to have safety for the Jews is democracy, equality, safety. Not uh, not a a country where some people are superior, especially not with the Arabs. The Arabs are not anti-Semites. They they did not participate in the Holocaust. They were we had good relations with with Arabs and Muslims. We are the same people basically. We look alike. You know, you look at me, you don't know if I'm Arab or or Israeli or and and I am from a Iraqi background. What is the point in 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 uh, exporting Zionism from Europe into the Middle East? That simply doesn't make sense. Do you think, in a lot of ways, that 
I guess cultural pluralism is the antidote to bigotries. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I mean, especially now where we are communicating and we have social media and we fly from one country to another with, you know, I can be in Tel Aviv and within 12 hours, 13 hours, I am in New York or I am in, you know, I can, I, I flew to, you can fly from, from Turkey to Baghdad within three hours. I'll tell you this, uh, Joseph, I, you know, it's funny ever since October 7th. And also after I have friends in Israel who are affected by, it, and now I have people I know uh, that have family in Gaza. So I, I know Israelis and Palestinians. And what's really interesting to me is that I talk to Palestinian Americans and Jewish Americans, and they're both saying the same thing to me right now. They feel very yeah. isolated. And I often hear the line, I just feel very alone uh, yeah. because they feel like on one side, you have Jewish Americans that feel like well, no one, no one's consoling me about October 7th. And then you have Palestinian Americans that are saying, you know, no one's consoling me about what's happening to my relatives in Gaza. Right. And in a weird way, I actually think Palestinians and, and Jewish uh, Americans, uh, Palestinian Americans, yeah. and Jewish Americans and Palestinians and, and Israelis have a lot in common. Exactly. Exactly. We we have a lot in common. We are actually I think I was, if there is a silver lining in the whole thing is the Jews and the Palestinians. Jews and Christian and Muslims who live in the United States, we can form a coalition to demonstrate to the whole world that we can live together in peace and, and enjoy each other's company. Last thing I want to touch upon. So I, I want to reiterate this. So with this confederation model, um, th so for you, for, for this confederation model is almost a compromise. So it wouldn't, you, you're trying to find a position that isn't necessarily exactly like yours, like, um, you know, anti-Zionist, you're, you're trying to find it with the Confederation, you're finding a position that will make maybe yourself happy. It could make uh, a Zionist like Dershowitz happy. It could make exactly. someone like uh, Chomsky happy. So it's, you're trying to kind yeah. of please everyone at the same time. No, I'm trying to make peace. I, I don't care about pleasing them, but it does please them. Okay, fair enough. Do you want to uh, promote any of the upcoming simulations you have coming up? I know you have one with uh, Mitchell Plitnik, who's a friend of the show. Yes, yes, we have one. I believe it's coming up uh, on uh, November. Uh, I want to say the twenty sixth. Yeah, and then uh, we have an interesting one on uh, December seven. Uh, no, December seventeen. I'm sorry, where um, two Palestinians and one Israeli are promoting their version of two states i am against the two state i think it's a waste of time but it's important in the context uh to of a common government to show that if the parliament decides to have a two state they could create a two state so we are going to have three versions of two states two versions by two Palestinians, one version by one Israeli, and we are going to vote on them. And and we'll decide. And I am thinking of, of bringing another version, but that will place take, take place on December 17th. But let me tell you, uh, JG, one thing. We don't really need the money to create the common government. And we don't need that. What we need is awareness. If there is an awareness that there is a way to make peace, if there is a major article in the New York Times, the Washington Post, or Le French Le Monde, or major paper asking questions just like you have, that will create awareness, that will bring reasonable people from all over the world to create this common government. It's not really about money. It's about awareness. I just wanted to ask briefly, could you talk about 
so we mentioned that that Alan Dershowitz has done a, a um, has interacted with you, uh, Chomsky. I, I just wanted to name some other people real quick here, and maybe you could talk about how they reacted to it. So uh, I believe Dennis Ross. I I know uh, Peter Biner has participated. Cornell West, uh, Gideon Levy has participated, and also Richard Falk. Uh, how how did some of these figures react to what you're doing? Look, they all say the same thing. This is a great idea, but it's not practical. Okay, they, they all say, they say, I congratulate you for doing this. There is no intellectual way to oppose this idea. Okay, there is no intellectual way to oppose this idea. You cannot oppose it. What you can oppose it on is the practicality of this happening. That's all. No uh, uh, rational thinking person could oppose this idea and articulate in opposition to it. Well, how can my listeners keep up with the work you're doing with the IPC? Well, s- send me an email, Joseph Avasar, J O S E F. A-V-E-S-A-R at gmail.com. And I will um I will uh, add them to uh the next simulation. Joseph Avasar at gmail.com. Thank you again, Joseph Avasar, for coming on Parallax Views. And I have to say, I you know, I know you said that people say, oh, well, this isn't practical and whatnot. But like I said, I mean, I, I think the mere fact that you're thinking through these things is uh a testament to something because no one else is. So, I mean, I mean, there's a few people, I think uh, Dahlia Shidlin and, and others are trying to think through how to find a solution, but, or a piece, but a lot of people aren't. So what you're doing is really important in my view. All right. Thank you so much, JG. Well, that does it for this edition of Parallax Views. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Joseph Avasar and that you'll check out the work of the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation. As always, if you appreciate the work here I do at Parallax Views, I cannot stress enough that I need your help to keep this show going. At patreon.com slash parallaxviews, patreon.com slash parallaxviews, you can contribute to this show's continued existence by kicking me some cash If you want, you can also email me if you'd prefer to send me a donation by way of PayPal. ParallaxViewsPod at ProtonMill.com if you'd like to do that. And with that being said... Until next time... You've been listening to Parallax Views with Parallax Views to Parallax Views with Parallax Views. The way out is not simply to say don't do it, just to prohibit. If nothing else, if we don't do it, others will be doing it like great. So you know we have to confront the problem. But no, basically, basically, I'm, I know of the great anxiety problems, new forms of control, but it's also new forms of freedom. This is why I always emphasize that uh, uh, internet and all this new digital stuff, it's a very ambiguous phenomenon, but it's the field of struggle. New forms of enslavement, but at the same time, new incredible forms of freedom. We have to accept the fight with no nostalgia for old, allegedly more authentic communities or whatever. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid.